president is uh, delayed uh, due to some plane trouble, so uh, you're stuck with me here to, uh, to chair the beginning of the meeting. And uh, the, uh, the first order of business uh, is to call the roll. Hildegard Aguinaldo. Darius Anderson. Present. Arnaldo Avalos. Here. Jeffrey Baum. Here. Joseph Belinsky. Present. Scott Budnick. Connie Conway. Iman DeLilly. Present. Tom Epstein. Here. Cecilia Estolano. Pamela Haynes. Jennifer Perry. Mon Fon. Here. Bill Rawlings. Present. Gary Reed. Valerie Shaw. Alexander Walker Griffin. Present. Okay, the, the next order of business is to uh, have the Pledge of Allegiance, and um, we want to have one of our new members lead the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm looking at my old buddy here, Darius Anderson, to uh, lead, the, lead us all in that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll wait for the president's report until the president actually gets here. Um, but I did want to uh, start by welcoming three new members of the Board of Governors. Um, Hildegard Aguinaldo, welcome, uh, Darius Anderson, and Bill Rawlings. And uh, if you'd like to take just uh, one minute each and just... Uh, Say how excited you are to be here and how you got here. That'd be, that'd be great. Let's start with you, Darius. My name is Darius Anderson. I'm an alumni of the system. I went to Santa Rosa JC, and I'm very proud to be here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hildegard Aguinaldo. I'm an alumni of the system uh, because I took uh, community college courses during high school. Um, I'm currently in-house counsel at a, a Fortune 181 healthcare company, and I'm excited to translate those skills to the space. It's a pleasure to meet you and a pleasure to serve. Bill. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Rawlings, and I'm also an alumni of the system at Fullerton College, uh, where I got a great CTE education that allowed me to have a, a wonderful long career so far is, as a classified uh, professional uh, currently at Mount San Antonio College in their academic technology department. And so we have had a changing of the guard. Uh, Nancy Sumner and Danny Hawkins uh, have, uh, have left the board. We wanted to uh, thank them very much for their great service. And in the next meeting, we will be honoring both of them and just wanted to uh, put that into the record. And as a reminder, persons wishing to make uh, public comments on items not on the agenda may do so at the end of today's calendar. Uh, we request that you complete a comment request card so that we can call your names in order. Public comments, as always, should be limited to three minutes. So with that, we'll uh, start with the uh, consent calendar. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the chancellor's report first. Thank you. It's OK. Um, <laughs> Tom doesn't want to hear my report. <laughs> I forgot he was here. <laughs> OK, this is going to be a fun meeting. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone, and um, happy Monday. Uh, welcome to the uh, Board of Governors meeting. Uh, I just want to take a few moment, moments to say uh, some thank yous and a few recognitions. First of all, I'm very um, proud and excited to welcome the participants of the Classified Leadership, Leadership Institute program um, at Chabot Las Positas, um, and the group is here led by their fearless leader, Dr. Jackson. Um, so I want to welcome them all. Please uh, stand up and uh, be recognized. Thank you for being here. This is uh, a wonderful opportunity to not only recognize uh, the value of our classified staff, but to encourage them to participate in leadership. Um, thank you for stepping up and being part of this leadership development program. Um, the classified staff are at the heart of our California Community College system. So thank you for being here, and I hope you enjoy the meeting. I also um, uh, want to um, thank the many, many, many faculty and staff that have 
been sending their feedback on a number of talk topics, most recently the uh, proposal to consolidate the categoricals. Um, just the surveys alone, we've received well over 1,500 surveys back from the field. So I want to thank everybody for continuing to um, support our push to get as much input as possible. And of course, uh, I want to thank um, all of the faculty uh, organization representatives, the classified representatives, um, and of course the CEOs and the other administrative groups for continuing to support our effort to gain as much input as possible into the major um, budget items uh, that we're working our way through. Um, uh, particularly around the, the funding formula, our work wouldn't be complete uh, if not for the great work of the Chief Executive Officer Group along with the Chief Business Officers. Uh, thank you for providing numerous hours of service. Your job isn't done yet. Uh, we're going to continue to work through this, and uh, we will come up with a formula that does serve the best interests of our students and uh, serves the interests of our colleges as well. I want to uh, recognize that for many students in the system, they are either beginning spring break or coming up on spring break, so I wish them all a safe break and that uh, make sure to come back to school. Uh, and thank um, all the faculty and staff at our 114 colleges for continuing to push forward through this um, spring semester. And then finally, on a um, sad note, I, I want to take a moment to um, honor one of the victims of last week's uh, shooting at the VA hospital in Yountville. Um, while it was uh, uh, another terrible tragedy, uh, it uh, uh, hit home at Napa College and in our system as a whole. One of the victims, Dr. Jennifer Gonzalez, was an employee of Napa Valley College. Uh, she worked there three days a week as a psychologist helping student veterans. So she gave her life uh, supporting our veterans, and uh, we honor her. Uh, we thank her for her service, um, and um, we wish her uh, uh, well, um, and uh, may she rest in peace. That's all I have. Uh, thank you. Uh, on to the uh, consent calendar, uh, uh, Deputy Chancellor Gonzalez. Good morning, Vice President Epstein, board members, Chancellor Oakley. Uh, item 1.1 is the consent item and presents the January 16, 2018 board meeting minutes for your review and approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Uh, Vice President, I failed to, to make one point. Uh, there is um, a change in the agenda. Uh, item 4.9 in the uh, front of the booklet that you have, uh, which shows the order of the agenda, is um, was not correct in your book. You have a replacement for that. There was just a, a typo. Item 4.9 has been adjusted to reflect the um, uh, the item that's actually in your book. So I just wanted to make you aware that you have another handout at your table uh, that reflects the correct um, order of the agenda. Okay. Um, moving on to uh, the action items, the approval of contracts and grants, uh, Deputy Chancellor Gonzalez. So this is item 2.1. It presents the contracts and grants for the Board of Governors. Today you have two renewal contracts, one renewal grant, and one amendment to an interagency agreement with the UC. The procedures and standing orders, and I'm reviewing this for our new board members, the procedures and standing orders of the Board of Governors require the Chancellor's Office to receive approval before entering into a contract or grant, which is in excess of $100,000 over three years in duration, or with respect to consulting services in excess of $50,000. Since there are only four items, I will walk you briefly through each of them. Item one is a, a renewal contract related to the associate degree for transfer program. 
This is ongoing communications and awareness campaigns. Some of the changes that you will see um, is the continuing work to make the associate degree for transfer program more accessible by making it uh, be mobile device friendly and uh, new added Spanish language interpretation. Item two is a renewal contract to provide management and maintenance support to the Equal Employment Opportunity Registry website. Item three is, the, is an amendment to an interagency agreement with the UC that will reimburse the Chancellor's Office for supports and trainings related to California resource families. These are guardians and caregivers of foster youth in the state of California. And finally, item four is a renewal grant to support a technical assistance provider to increase efficient coordination for the Workforce Economic Development Division. This is year four or five for this grant. With that, I would be happy to answer any questions or bring up any of our vice chancellors to provide more detailed answers. Any questions? Uh, Joseph. Well, I want to make one comment about the first one, given the information we were provided, that given the quality of these associate degrees for transfer, I do hope that President Napolitano can make this a, a high-level item in the UC system. In terms of the second grant, how do the colleges get involved with that registry? Uh, Mark will come up. So the registry um, oh. is essentially an uh, online. Vice Chancellor, could you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Mark LaForest, J. General Counsel. Uh, Mr. Vice President, Chancellor. Morning. Um, the registry is an online uh, service database for employment opportunities within the community college system. Um, and and uh, the registry is operated out of Yosemite Community College District on behalf of the, uh, the Chancellor's Office. So, so automatically. colleges automatically uh, register their job postings with the registry. Yes. Member Shaw. Hi. Under um, item number one, um, how, how are we outreaching to the African American community? You know, there are certain ways that you can do that, to also the Latino community too, through radio. What, what's the mechanism there? And, and particularly regarding faith-based entities. Um, so that's part of the work that this contract would do. Um, I just gave you some examples. I, I We can bring up... Uh, the academic division or the communications division, but that is a part of the work that this contract will do. Okay, so who is, I guess who are the African American entities that are participating in coming up with the approach? Vice Chancellor Feast. Good morning, Paul Feast, Vice Chancellor for Communications and Marketing. Um, so the outreach that uh, we're doing with this campaign uh, involves a lot of um, outreach at community events. Uh, we go to events where there are a number of uh, students gathered, including uh, minority students. Like uh, we went to the Fresno uh, Juneteenth Day celebration, and we had a table, and we kept pass out information. <laughs> and we have you went to Juneteenth, Paul? Huh? <laughs> Juneteenth? Okay, yeah. keep going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But we, we don't have a, we, we are looking at doing the faith-based uh, part of this, much as we are doing it with the uh, career education campaign, and we're a member of that, that, that committee, so. Okay. Okay, I would suggest, though, that we come up with something specific targeted to the various communities, particularly the faith-based. So I, and I, so I, you can just brief me later on this, but I, I'm interested in how you're really outreaching to these communities. Sure. Okay, thank you. Member Perry. Um, this is sort of a selfish request. At some point, I'd love to see the materials associated with um, number three, because my interest is in foster care, and see if they might be changing, given what's going on with um, the CCR reforms in the state of California. So if you could just send those to me at some juncture, because I'd like to see what the, what the involvement is and what the materials look like. Great. Thank I'd be you. happy to do that. Uh, Member Baum. I'm obviously going to support all of these, but I just wanted to make the point, especially with new board members and that I've made before, 
it just baffles me sometimes to see these contracts uh, being outsourced to other districts, but then for programs that are run and focused on, on statewide uh, success uh, metrics. And so we, there's a, an inefficiency and a waste of resources that at some point I hope we can uh, continue to beat the drum to say, why, isn't, why aren't these programs run centrally through the chancellor's office as opposed to uh, outsourced to local districts uh, when they are statewide programs? And to the extent that I've been hearing some of the media for promoting the uh, uh, transfer degrees and the uh, uh, I can afford college.com, so keep up the good work on some of that as well. Although I'm not the target audience, but uh, <laughs> but it just tells you what I've been listening to on the radio. When I'm listening to Power 106 in LA, mm -hmm. it's, uh, <laughs> I can hear some of those. Thank you. Uh, Okay, I think that that's all the comments. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll entertain a motion. I move. Second. Okay, motion and seconded. Any other comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, moving on. Um, next item 2.2, uh, the approved plan for uh, work experience credit. And we're going to have uh, Alice Perez. Hello, Vice President, Mr. Vice President, and Chancellor Oakley and board members. My name is Alice Perez. I'm Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. And item 2.2 is brought forward for action, and our request is to adopt these uh, amended regulations that really cover cooperative work experience in our further efforts to streamline our curriculum processes. So uh, this came for public hearing in January and is here today for um, approval and adoption. Uh, Member Blansky. Just to say again, thank you for helping us streamline because one of the things, again, about this that will be very good is that we can keep the plans up to date, much further up to date by having them approved local locally. Control. Yes, the local control is really a boon for that. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Vice Chancellor Perez, for the benefit of the new members, can you just give a brief example of what the action will do? Yes. Uh, the action is basically going to allow, rather than the curriculum for cooperative work experience coming through the Chancellor's office and through our processes here for approval, there now will be local control. So meaning, at all our local colleges, every college has a curriculum committee. It's, it's made up usually of its articulation officer and faculty members and its faculty who are putting curriculum through their systems. So this would mean that the credit and the work plans for CWE would now go through those local districts rather than coming up here. So that's the streamlining effect. The other regulation that we're changing is we're allowing that, that credit to be down to the half unit level so now we can we can give credit through the local level, through the local uh, curriculum committees for for increments of a half a unit, and that was not that was not in Title V prior to this change. Does that make sense? Some of this can be very turgid, but we can we can break it down. <laughs> it, it'll for make you. sense someday. Yeah, that's but at right. least we're beginning. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That, that's not the last time you'll hear the word turgid in one of our board meetings. <laughs> Thank you, Vice um, President. <laughs> are, uh, are we ready for a, a vote here? Um, I need a motion. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Approved unanimously. On to item 2.3, Vice Chancellor Mattoon. Good morning. Item 2.3 action to approve board sponsorship of AB 1935 by Assemblymember Irwin. You'll recall at the September board meeting, you approved a 2018-19 budget and advocacy, budget and legislative request. This item was not included in that request as it was still undergoing internal review. So I'm here before you today to ask for official approval of board sponsorship of this bill. It would authorize non-credit apportionment for supervised tutoring to students enrolled in degree applicable and transfer level courses. 
Supervised tutoring involves trained tutors working under the direction of a qualified faculty member in a learning center environment, providing supports to students who need additional instruction to be successful in their coursework. It's long been considered a, an effective student success practice. The background talks about some of the uh, results of various research showing that supervised tutoring is associated with higher GPAs and pass rates in courses. Under our current regulatory structure, only non-credit courses are eligible for apportionment in super for supervised tutoring. This would extend that authorization to credit-bearing courses. It aligns with our goals within the Guided Pathways Framework, as well as with the implementation of AB 705, approved by the legislature last year, to reduce remediation sequences and place more students into transfer-level courses. So I'm here to respectfully request your approval for sponsorship of this bill. I have a question, thank you. Uh, regarding the tutoring, uh, it, we are specifically referring to student uh, tutors here. Uh, there are some colleges that'll have uh, classified paraeducators. Would those also be included in this? Yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, so the <clears throat> tutors themselves will have credits, will earn credits for tutoring? Uh, you mean if it were a student tutor? Yeah. Uh, yes. These are student tutors we're talking about. It could be right? a student tutor or it could it be could a paraprofessional. Be. Okay. And, um, you know, the compensation associated with that is uh, at the district level. Really, this is about whether or not the college can claim non-credit apportionment for the hours associated with the tutoring. I see. So okay. it's a way for the college to receive funding, funding. to support the practice. Okay. Never hands. Hands. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I, I want to make certain I, I understand um, the use of the tutor and the extent to which there is flexibility. So when, when I read this, I'm, I'm thinking of con sort of the co-requisite model <laughs> of a student is placed in a math or English class and um, may need some resources to, to assist them while they're going through that particular course. Um, and so as I've understand understood it, um, it would be aligned with with that particular course. So I'm wondering, um, can this particular tutor model sort of be just out there? I, I, um, it, when it's a co-requisite, it's absolutely aligned uh, in a way that a student is taking, I don't know what the math sequence is, or the e English 300 or whatever that college level course is, um, and then the student is really getting help. It, the, 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 as the curriculum is being um, taught and learned by the student, they're getting these resources that align with what they're actually doing. D am I understanding that part correctly? Or is it much more broader than... This it, I, it is broader. Okay. I would say the co-requisite model is a very specific model right. where a student enrolls in two courses um, and receives that supplemental support right. in that second course. This is generally a more flexible model where okay. a student may be enrolled in a course and then go into the learning center for additional hours of support as they needed for maybe a specific assignment they've received. Okay. Um, it's more flexible. One thing I'll note in the bill, it does authorize the board to adopt regulations. If, there are additional parameters that should be placed on supervised tutoring, the board would have the authority to do so. That's helpful, thank you. Member Belansky. I have two questions, just so I understand. The apportionment, it's not enhanced funding. No, it's non-credit. Well, there is enhanced non-credit in right. four areas. That's why I was asking if this would be a fifth area. Okay. And then on the, the second page, 22, it talks about the Department of Motor Vehicles to provide expanded access to information regarding the wage outcomes of students. How will the college get access to that? That is a comment around the other bill that we're sponsoring this year that was approved in the board's um, September legislative and budget request. Um, but I can speak to that bill, the Medina bill, if you'd like me to, briefly. Briefly, in the sense of how will the colleges know to that you can get into this database? It would be a system-level database between the Department of Education, the Chancellor's Office, and the DMV. And then similar to what you do in Launch Board, you can pull that data down at the local level. Yeah, Rob. 
I have a more general question just about, as we assemble the building blocks to the vision for success, and this is a part of it, um, how are we tracking and developing a dashboard for that? And, and we don't have to answer it with respect to this topic, but I, I want to be able to see how all the pieces are fitting into outcomes and how we can, as a board, kind of see how it's all uh, working out. So I can uh, briefly speak to that. Um, there is a, a large effort within the, the chancellor's office to begin to simplify the metrics um, that we use uh, and to align them with um, uh, primarily things like the guided pathways framework. So launch board is the primary driver of this, uh, the housing of the metrics. So as we come back to you with uh, future updates on the vision for success, those are the issues that we're going to be putting front and center um, because of the many, of the myriad of reporting requirements that we have for the 114 colleges, we need to consolidate those uh, in order for them to make sense at the highest level for the vision for success. So everything that, that we uh, now uh, talk about changing or, or reforming has to be aligned with the vision for success. So whether it's categorical consolidation, we're going to revamp the reporting requirements for that, the guided pathways framework, um, even things like um, as we're working through iterations of the funding formula, we want to make sure that we have a very simplified, straightforward reporting requirement that not only allows 114 colleges to easily report back to us, but allows us to report back to you in a simplified way. Uh, so that is the direction we're going, and you'll see a lot more on that in future meetings. Okay. Um, can I entertain a motion for item 2.3? Move approval. Avalos and uh, Shaw. Okay. Oh. That was me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You were, you were both too quiet. I couldn't hear the distinct <laughs> voice, as you often are, Member Shaw. Um, uh, okay, with that, um, any other discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Oh, excuse me. My second major error of the day. Um, we do have a comment, a public comment, uh, from uh, Julie Bruno. I apologize. Good morning, uh, Vice President Epstein. Thank you for remembering me, um, board members, Chancellor Christina Oakley. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this, the subject of AB 1935 falls within academic Senate purview, specifically number three of the 10 plus one in Title V standards or policies regarding student preparation and success. Uh, the academic Senate fully supports the intent of AB uh, 1935. We firmly believe that tutoring is critical to our students being able to succeed in their courses, and we're really pleased that we're breaking that open to include tutoring for uh, uh, degree applicable and transfer level. We would actually like to request amendments um, that include basic skills courses in that line as well. We know that they're included in Title V, but we think that they're appropriate to call out all the courses that we might use tutoring for in this particular piece of legislation. And our other interest is to ensure that students can be uh, not only referred by a faculty member, which is how it exists now, but also do self-referral so that they can actually walk into the tutoring center regardless of what's going on with them. They don't have to go through a faculty member or uh, anybody else, like a counseling member or something like that. So um, we would request that as your this is on your radar, we would very much like to see those pieces also included in this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you want to reply to that? Uh, we agree with the Academic Senate's perspective on that and the interest of only having statute uh, speak to the things that statute must speak to. We thought we'd address those two items in regulation, but we're also happy to incorporate them into the bill itself. What would be your recommendation? Yeah, this is a very early in the process. If the Academic Senate wants those items for support of the bill, I would recommend to the author that she incorporate them moving the bill forward. Okay. So would that uh, change this recommendation here that we're voting on? Uh, I would concur that if 
those comments made by Ms. Bruno could be inco uh, incorporated, that'd be great. Okay. All right, with that uh, advisement, uh, we'll uh, seek, I guess we already have a, uh, a motion and a second, maybe two seconds. Uh, and all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, uh, moving on to 2.4, non-resident tuition exemption, uh, second reading with uh, Vice Chancellor LaForestier. Good morning again, Mark LaForestier, General Counsel. Uh, this item is for the board's approval. It was uh, heard on first reading in the last hearing. Um, and particularly for the new board members, uh, Senate Bill 68 amended the AB 540 non-resident tuition exemption in a number of ways, uh, most, uh, uh, most notably to allow non-credit coursework and adult school coursework to be uh, considered in, um, for, as an eligibility criteria for the non-tuition um, exemption. Uh, we have received no comments on the uh, proposed regular, re regulatory change, and we would ask your approval uh, of this item. Member Belansky. I assume this will pass. So when will this go into full effect with these right, you know, specifics? It will be 30 days. Uh, from uh, approval of the of the item of today, from yes. this. and then does some kind of an electronic memo get sent to the colleges? Since I'm not aware of all that. Uh, well, one of the things that we will be doing on this is there is an old uh, general counsel's opinion on on point, which would be superseded by this regulatory change. So we will be uh, uh, issuing a new opinion uh, to inform the districts of this regulatory change, and that will will put out within the next 30 days. So like the chancellor of the college presidents would get the Correct. Okay. Thank you, and, and this is wonderful, but my question is, uh, what, are, what are the efforts within the chancellor's office and in falling into the districts on actually marketing uh, this questionnaire form? And it's wonderful if we have it, it's wonderful if we approve it, but if, this doesn't get into the hands of the students that need it. Uh, this point is more or less uh, opaque. So, what are the, what are the real efforts behind this? Well, we've already circulated. The, you're talking about the joint uh, form, right? Well, uh, we have already circulated that uh, form to the districts. Uh, we uh, entered into discussions with the other segments to uh, come up with the form, and we have already circulated it to all the districts. And I understand it. My understanding is it in use and available to students now. So do you know of any examples district-wide of specific things they're doing to get this out? Uh, to, to get it out, my understanding is it is available when, when students are uh, registering for courses and, and, the, and the local districts should be making sure the students are available or are aware of the opportunity. But I'm not, I'm not aware of specific district examples of, of what uh, the local districts are doing to advertise. Yeah. My, yeah, but I, there, there might be a difference between available and right. noticeable. Mm -hmm. And I, I know there's a lot of things, I, I mean, as a student of uh, community college, I'm sure Alex could also attest that uh, there are a lot of opportunities and uh, resources that are available that a lot of people don't know about. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that uh, we can somehow figure out a way to make sure it's available and noticeable. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Thank you. And here yeah, Member Walker Griffin. Griffin. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark. I, I appreciate what you've been doing for us. So there's a quick question I have. Um, so towards the bottom of page 29, it says affirm that the he or she has filed an application to legalize his or her immigration status or pretty much um, says that they will eventually. Is there a timeline for how long the person has to fill that out? No. Okay, perfect. And then um, is there like, like a follow-up and say the person doesn't do it? That's not required. Okay, it's just, it, it is, it is uh, the, the school is... Uh, uh, it is appropriate for the school to take the uh, affidavit of the student. So whatever the student says they're doing, they're doing, and that's sufficient for the school. Okay, thank you. Just one to clarify, too, um, since this may come up, I support this. Uh, the, the, law, the Senate Bill 68 on the non-resident 
tuition assistance, the California Department of Corrections Rehabilitation. So, uh, does that mean if, if somebody's incarcerated, they can uh, uh, qualify as then a resident based on their incarceration? So the, the thing about the AB 540 uh, e exemption is it is not actually focused on residency per se. It's focused mm -hmm. on the amount of coursework that a person has, uh, has had. So it's not, it's not focused on where they're resident. Or you're, you're asking about potentially a person who's incarcerated from another state, but, but local and is, is present in California? Correct. Right, that would not be a factor under this non-resident tuition exemption because the focus is on the coursework that they've done and whether they've done it in California or not. Right, so it's uh, somebody can't come into uh, California, commit a crime, be incarcerated, and then get qualify for statewide residency to get non-resident uh, tuition benefits. Right, they'd have to have three years of coursework, and and the, this is focused on the I think for the for the um, non-credit coursework, it's up for a, up to a year. So, so I, but he, okay, so I, I, think the I commit a crime, is, I'm imprisoned, I take classes while I'm in prison, do I qualify for uh, resident tuition benefits? I don't think it would be possible to qualify for non-resident tuition benefits. I, I haven't looked at that hypothetical specifically, and the statute is, uh, you know, has a number of provisions. I'm not sure if there might be a way to thread your way through that, but I don't think so. Okay, thanks. Yes, member Bill. That's my question based upon the question he has. It could be possible that somebody would be incarcerated long enough that they could do three years of full-time high school work. Um, yeah, I, I think there's, I have to look at the back of the statute, but my recollection is that the anticipation is that there would be up to one year of non-credit coursework. I, I may be misremembering that. Member Haynes. So I'm, I'm not sure how close we, sh we should be looking at this. However, um, given that a number of our colleges have programs in um, um, some of our prisons, and, and we're encouraging students who are incarcerated to take them, uh, it would be worth to have some kind of clarification, I well, guess. We, we could look at that issue and, and put out a guidance on that. Okay, um, item 2.4, do we have a motion? Yes. Member Rawlings, uh, second. second. Member Belansky. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, moving on to item 2.5, uh, Vice Chancellor LaForestier. And, uh, and I see you gave us a handout uh, that's in addition uh, to the, uh, to what was in the packet is uh, the maps and a little uh, demographic breakout that was not in our original packet. Correct. That's for the Victor Valley election right. change. So uh, there are two items here. Election, the Assembly Bill 684 in 2011 uh, enacted Education Code 72036 to allow governing boards of community college districts to change from at-large election systems to by trustee area election systems. The purpose of the law was to address the dilution of minority votes in at-large elections and to allow community college districts to ensure compliance with the California Voting Rights Act. To date, 30 of the 72 districts have by trustee area elections. And uh, today we have two more in the works. Uh, the General Counsel's Office has reviewed submissions by Victor Valley College and the Coast Community College District, and each has met the criteria for board approval. They have adopted a resolution of support. They have divided their territory into trustee areas. They have established an election process, and the trustee areas reflect substantially equivalent populations. Um, I have with me today Roger Wagner, who is president of the Victor Valley College, to uh, provide any uh, additional information you want and answer questions. Welcome, President Wagner. We, uh, we began our process in uh, the late 2016 calendar year. Um, then in January, the process changed a little bit. Timelines changed on us. We had our first presentation to the board in March of 17. Uh, this was done at the college's uh, own volition at my recommendation. Our process moved a bit slow. Uh, I think in August, we received a letter from an attorney uh, 
uh, challenging our district. I was able to respond that we're in the process of doing it. We finally got the process done with all of our uh, maps and everything in early th this year, this calendar year. So we were able to do this and avoid any high legal costs. Uh, just I was going to make one comment for those of you who may not know in this map that we were given at the uh, the demographics it, it has the uh, the acronym CVAP which is citizen voting age population just in case you were wondering member fine I'm curious there are districts that have seven members and districts that have five members is there a rule of thumb or any process to that uh, districts are authorized to have five and up to nine members, um, and it's a local decision as to whether they, what number of, of uh, trustee areas they want to have. So in your case, was there a rationale to that? The board did consider the possibility of looking at seven. With these numbers where we set the districts go with our, our national census, and rather we wanted to become compliant first of all. And when we had discussions about going to seven districts, the board decided it'd be better if we waited till after the uh, 2020 census so we'd have better numbers to work with. Okay, member. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I want to first say thank you so much for um, adding an addendum um, with the, the um, for, I think this is plan three that was agreed upon by, by your board. Um, because it was unclear, um, I had the opportunity of listening to your, your board meeting where you made this particular decision, and um, only because I just like doing that on my free time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, there was no discussion among your body about the demographics and the compelling need to to really go to district elections as opposed to at large. So I was just, I was wondering, so I appreciate the census information about who really is in your districts. I didn't realize actually that the African-American population um, in, in one of those districts is as high as it is, so that, that's helpful. And I just want to note um, that there was a lot of discussion around having a seven district area um, uh, sort of map um, and that you will be going back um, when you when you look at that. Uh, I suspect um, that this has to be um, approved again when it happens um, by this particular body. So I would really encourage that this breakdown of, and that consideration, there was a lot, um, communities of interest are key, that it, it, it relates to the California law, but it also re relates to federal, and so, um, so community of interest absolutely have to do with whether or not there's a freeway going between neighborhoods or not, or whether or not um, uh, uh, you are still attached to, um, to school districts. There was discussion around that, but there really wasn't discussion around um, making certain that the diversity is represented on, on the board. So I'm hoping that there's a fuller discussion of that relative to as you design that seven board um, uh, have that discussion when you're enlarging the number of members on your on your board. Thank you. Member Avalos, and I'm happy to turn the gavel over to President Estelano. I only made two significant mistakes in your. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <clears throat> Um, so I have a quick question. Currently, what, what is your uh, current ethnic makeup of, of your trustees? Yeah, right now, all of our, all of our trustees are uh, Caucasian, white, non-Hispanic. Okay. Um, the other question I have, it's for the Vice Chancellor. Can we, can we do some sort of analysis to find out what's, what is the, we have a sense of what, you know, five versus seven. But do we have a sense of what the ethnic uh, diversity is within the five or the seven, right? Is 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 five more diverse when you look at it, or seven when you have seven representation? Just because, you know, the conversation for me is, you know, why do we? Uh, who makes decision on the five versus seven? 
and and what are the implications of that, right? Yeah. So, and I want to look at it from if it's really about representation. I want to make sure we have a good diversified recommendation representation for trustees. But is seven or five more so or less? Um, and I'd like to see that analysis. That'd be I think something that'd be interesting. Yeah, it would be okay. Yeah. Okay, any other questions to other members of the BOG? Okay. I'll move approval of the recommendation. We have a motion by Board Member Baum. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, second by members. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are now on item 2.6. Request to change election system at the Coast Community College District. Okay, this is uh, the same exercise with respect to Coast Community College District, and we have today John Wipesfenning, the Chancellor of the Community College District, and Jim Marino, a trustee. Great, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, as uh, Victor Valley, our Board of Trustees engaged uh, in a good and lengthy discussion uh, of this matter leading to the passing of a resolution in October to change the district to by trustee area voting. And uh, we're here today to uh, gain your approval as well. Okay, are there any questions by members of the board? Yes, board member Fon. Again, inspired by what was just mentioned there, um, the difference between five and seven. Uh, now, Coles, um, your district resides in a community that I'm though don't live there, are quite familiar with the makeup of um, Asian Americans, particularly Vietnamese Americans, is predominant. And I'm seeing in the number here that um, percent, percentage of Asian Americans is about 24% of the total 641,000 population. Um, and I know, uh, the little I know in that community is that um, Vietnamese Americans are on school boards, local school boards, city council, definitely, board of soups, <coughs> uh, the state legislature, as well as the sanitation district. But I don't see any Vietnamese American or Asian represented in, in your particular um, um, board. I'm curious, is there a reason or do you, have you looked into that or, and that probably begs the question, uh, going to five members versus seven members like you, like uh, Mike Hockley here was uh, alluding to, is there benefit to that? I mean, I'm just throwing out questions to see uh, if, if the uh, factors could be considered in the expansion from five to seven. The board has, in fact, uh, had discussions about expanding to seven, uh, touching on many of the issues that you just raised. Uh, continuing with the current boundary areas that define the trustee areas at this time, uh, one of the current boundary areas is, in fact, Vietnamese majority. Uh, so by simply moving to voting by the same areas, uh, and uh, we will allow for one majority area to be Vietnamese. Uh, beyond that, the board has committed to continuing the discussion of expansion in time for the 2020 election. And in fact, we have a fairly detailed plan, uh, complete with a timeline uh, that lays out uh, the schedule for those discussions. Board Member Rawlings. Thank you. Uh, along a similar line, I take a look here and I see in the demographics, I see a lot of uh, Hispanic as well. Uh, and uh, in taking a look at the five to seven, on your plan for 2020, uh, is that an item that would be looked at as well? Because I see, you know, you, you remain a, uh, you know, a number of the uh, the districts, uh, the areas remain uh, very high uh, white non-Hispanic, but in each of those areas, I see a pretty substantial Hispanic population as well. Uh, I'm up in Davenbar, so I'm a bit north of you, but I take a look at that. And I think maybe there's a way uh, if you move to seven that, uh, that you might be able to expand the diversity of the board and the representation. We, we did look specifically at that matter, and uh, our consultants were not able to come up with a majority Hispanic uh, area. But we will revisit that, I'm certain. Board Member Walker Griffin. 
Thank you. Um, so Orange uh, Coast College, that's in Orange County, correct? Correct. Okay, so I'm looking at the um, <clears throat> number of the black population pretty much, and it pretty much is only 1% of the entire district. So um, what efforts are you guys going to try to do to make sure that African Americans and um, just blacks in general have equal representation along the board? Thank you for the question. Uh, Jim Moreno, uh, trustee, East Coast, uh, the only uh, Hispanic on the board, and I'm proud of it. Uh, to answer your question, Mr. Walker Griffin, uh, we make sure that uh, if we don't have a representative on the board, that for the different committees, the oversight committees for finance, for the uh, the swap meets, which is a, a big deal, our enterprise, and other, uh, like the Measure REM oversight construction, that we do have representative people, different folks. We have Vietnamese that we appoint. We have a black gentlemen and ladies and folks that we just know have to reflect the population that we serve. So we may not have a person elected in that particular category, but we do want them involved in the decision making and oversight of the dollars that we are entrusted with. So we try that way. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Baum. I just want to make two points. One is I'm very familiar with this district. Actually, my mom served on the Board of Trustees for 13 years uh, in this seat that is now held by Mr. Moreno. Um, in the past, it was as election by district, but I guess what you're saying now is you ran by seat, but you had to run district wide. Now it's just uh, each district represents. It was a, an odd system. You had to. Uh, designate by a district, but then still have to campaign to over a million people. Uh, is that uh, the, the change that's being made here? What's happened is that we were elected at large. So it was the entire district. All five areas uh, would vote for the individual. Right, so in Laguna Beach would determine what Westminster's exactly. representative exactly. was. So now, but you had to live in or, the district. Or, now we are going to be, Beach. we're going to be elected by area. So there are five areas. Right. So. Also, one point that I, I think is a point of pride for the Coast District, not just because my mom served there, but two of our chancellors came through the Coast District. Our own Chancellor Eloy Oakley got his start at uh, Golden West College, and then Jack Scott was uh, on the uh, ad a senior administrator at Orange Coast College. So it's done good work for the state. And if I could add, we took um, a real close look at the seven seats for our, for our district, and uh, the numbers are there to support seven. Uh, the board, uh, I did not support that position. I did bring the issue up, but the board went ahead and continued with the five, and I, I respect and support the decision of the board, and uh, we are still going to look at it in the future. Uh, but uh, from the presentations made to our board, we had a large Vietnamese population come and speak. We had leaders of the community. We had leaders from the Hispanic community come and speak. So it's an issue that is sensitive, not just because of the lawsuit threats, but because we know who we serve in our district, and we want to make sure that they are at the table. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Vice President. Okay. Yeah, just one last those. comment. Um, <clears throat> when I look at your student population, which I went into the dashboard and I looked at it, you know, on average, um, at least the coastline, you had 9% African Americans. Uh, and a Asian Americans made about 27%, Hispanic made about 25%, and white 30%. Very mixed, right? A and yet, obviously, as we know, uh, the trustee is not anywhere close to that diversity. So, you know, the fact that you are moving to five, I I'm hopefully encouraged that we reflect a little more what the student population looks like. And I wonder, again, if we went to seven, would it be even more <coughs> reflective of the student population? Um, and it go goes to my point again, we should look at the seven versus five. Thanks. I appreciate the uh, the detail in the uh, in the demographic sheet that was provided. I think we ought to try and get that information from every district that uh, that, that proposes a change. Um, the, qu the question I had was, I noticed that this was a three-two vote on the board, and I was curious if you could tell me a little bit about the dynamics, uh, why the people who voted no were opposed. I'll let the chancellor answer that. <laughs> for for uh, uh, for uh, to, to get a report, I, I was one of the two that voted against it. But I do respect our vote, and we'll support what we have to do. 
As we went through the public hearing process, receiving testimony, uh, I think there was a lot of discussion on both sides of staying at five versus going to seven. Uh, and I think the majority of the board felt that at this time, they simply wanted to learn more about what it would mean to go to seven, because there are implications of that uh, in terms of cost to the district. Uh, there's some facility costs and other, other things that, that come into play. So yes, it was a three to two vote, but that did include this plan to continue the discussion after the 2018 election. Any other questions by members of the board? Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Is that, I'm sorry, sorry Valerie, can you hear? Okay, got it. Very quiet. Very quiet. <laughs> Do I have a second? Okay, Sean Perry. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. You've been redistricted. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Um, we're now on item 2.7, which is the appointment of three representatives for implementing the Earn and Learn models for allied, allied health professions. And I think our executive vice chancellor, Anton Quimlevin, will be presenting. President Estelano, uh, Vice President Epstein, Chancellor Oakley, and members of the board. Uh, item 2.7 has received a pre-review from President Estelano and upgraded for her feedback. It requests uh, your approval to submit three names to a sister agency called the Division of Consumer Affairs, which does a lot of licensure in the uh, healthcare arena. And um, they are being tasked to update policies and look at barriers that are in the way for students to um, do more, uh, acquire more work-based learning as they develop their um, uh, careers in healthcare uh, so, so that um, their policies and practices are more conducive to internships, clinicals, and apprenticeships. Are there any questions for our Executive Vice Chancellor? Yeah, Board Member Baum. Is this the first time we've made an appointment to this board? Or, because I don't remember it coming before us before. It's, um, it's a, a statute, uh, um, actually it's uh, AB 2105 by Rodriguez that is tasking this agency to do this uh, special task force. So it, is this it's the first, first appointment. Time. This the is first the first time, time we've Yeah, it's our first this. set of appointments. Thank you. And then it sunsets in 2020. Uh, board Member Velansky. Given that this focuses on allied health professions, how do they interact with the colleges? I mean, how does colleges get information from them? Uh, input that they might give to the board? Well, uh, these three individuals do a lot of work with our colleges, and um, one of the issues with the Division of Consumer Affairs is that uh, they're being tasked to broaden the number of constituents uh, that they're uh, communicating with in order to, to determine these policies. So I think this is tasking that division to begin to broaden the, their perspective and worldview. But will they reach out to colleges that have allied health programs and say, hey, we're here, and if we can help you do anything, we'd love to do that? We'll equip all these three um, representatives with uh, that advice. Thank you. Yeah, and, and uh, Board Member Blansky, if you look at their bios, all three of them are very, very engaged with our community colleges. It may not show on all of their resumes, but each of these three have a long history working with our campuses. Um, so they're in a good position to represent our segment to the Consumer Affairs Division. Any other questions? Board Member Avalos. Yeah, just, just curious about the process of how these, these three were um, selected. C can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, so we uh, um, turned to our sector strategies. So we, as you know, we have a sector navigator, uh, sector experts in the healthcare area, and we asked for, for who were some advisors who were very active with our colleges. Uh, and so these three um, have been around the block in terms of advising policies and have been in discussions with our system around how to build up uh, work experience. Other questions? Okay, um, take a motion. Okay, Vice President Epstein, Board Member Rollins as the seconder. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Vaughn. Okay, our next item. So that's it for our action items. Um, we're moving on to first readings. Um, so first we have item 3.1, the minimum qualifications for apprenticeship proposed revisions to California Code of Regulations. We do? Great. 
Hello, Madam President Estelano, Vice President and Chancellor Oakley and board members. Item 3.1 is a first reading of proposed regulations to amend Title V, Section 53413. These pertain to the minimum qualifications for our apprenticeship instructors. And a, a group of stakeholders involved with this process with the Chancellor's Office have worked for a good many months to be able to come up with these changes. We're, we're very excited about them because by changing that unit requirement level uh, from 18 to 12, we're really hoping that we're going to be able to bring on a larger pool of instructors who would be able to come in and work in the teach in the apprenticeship program. You can see all the strikeout information and the amendment changes, and it's here for first reading and public hearing. And we would hope to be able to bring it back uh, in May for second reading. Questions? If I could just add to um, uh, Vice Chancellor Perez's uh, description, this is um, um, the, the question came up earlier from Board Member Baum: How do what we're doing connect with a vision for success? This issue connects directly with our ability to prepare more students to get into the workforce and be placed in jobs. The whole apprenticeship movement is something that we are very focused on, and we need to update our regulations to allow for more qualified faculty to be able to teach in these mm -hmm. programs. So we see this as a critical issue to the success of that portion of the vision for success. Board Member Haynes, followed by Board Member Polanski. So I just want to thank everyone who really worked on this because it really raises the level of um, the importance of experience and that we really need to have that, that balance between in classroom and then what folks have done in the field in terms of their work experience. And so to, to those who opened and broadened their, that perspective to make certain that we have experienced um, faculty and staff and those who are not sort of faculty from, from a, a tr more traditional perspective is really, really key to the work that we're doing on our campuses. If I may just call out, you know, that's our, so we have our strong workforce team here who worked diligently with this, our CTE faculty, our, ac our statewide academic senate, and our faculty yes. leadership. So all of them are to be commended. Absolutely. And thank you for calling that out. And for the sake of the new board members, if we can oh, yes. try to state <laughs> what the acronym stands for, we'll give them one yes. chance to, <laughs> to gain uh, knowledge of all these acronyms. Yes, so to break down the ASCCC, that's our statewide associated, um, that's our statewide senate for all the California community colleges in the system. And our, um, what we call WED, is workforce and educational development, and and you just met uh, Vice Chancellor Vontan Quinlevin. She represents that body. We have Lynn Shaw here. She also works with our strong workforce efforts, and Julie Bruno and John Stanskis. They're part of our sen they are our Senate leadership for the state. So, point well taken, Chancellor. <laughs> Break down those acronyms. Board Member Belansky. I want to just uh, note that in a couple of weeks there will be a spring plenary for the State Academic Senate. And on the last day of the spring plenary, there are often a lot of resolutions that the full body of representatives from across the state get to vote on. And one of the topics that will be voted on resolution is this change in the minimum qualifications. And I'll just read the resolution because in all likelihood, because it's being sent forth by the executive committee, it will pass and therefore will have the academic senate's endorsement officially that the Academic Senate support the revisions to the minimum qualifications for credit apprenticeship instructors stated in Title V, Section 53413, as approved by the California Apprenticeship Council and supported by the Executive Committee of the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges and urge approval of the revisions by the Board of Governors. And I just wanted to say that because I think it's important to know that uh, this has gone through a lot of review at the uh, faculty level. Thank you, Board Member Belansky. Board Member Delili. Thank you. Uh, I had a quick question on how the workforce uh, or how the committee decided to key in on the 12 semester unit requirements 
as that as that requirement to level down compared to uh, maybe leveling down the six years of occupational experience or the four years with an associate degree? How is the unit requirement the one that was keyed in on? Thanks, Board Member Delali. I'd like uh, to call up Lynn Shaw, who is present at, in all of this uh, process. If she would like to speak to that, I would like to invite her up. I, I think at the beginning we... Uh, Hi, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Lynn Shaw, hi. Um, I'm the visiting dean of sector strategies for the Workforce and Economic Development Division and, and I'm visiting faculty from Long Beach City College of Electrical Technology. So the, the unit debate was um, given to 12 instead of 18 because many colleges had 18 unit semesters at one time and time has changed. So most colleges have like a 16 week semester. So it was kind of a long year and a half negotiation that we reduced it to a more uh, up to the up to date kind of uh, number of units. And, and the clear consensus uh, was to reduce the unit cap rather than any other factor. Yeah, the experience, that was never under consideration to change that. No one, no one felt like we wanted uh, our industry experts to have less industry experience. As a matter of fact, that's what we really wanted to bring into the classroom. So we left the six years alone. Other questions? Okay, and I think we have a couple of public comments on this. Vice President. We, we do. Uh, Julie Bruno and Jack Buckhorn. Yeah, you can bring John. You make it's okay. okay. John. Hey, John. And John Stanskis just submitted oh. his speaking request. Uh, President and then, Stilano. And then we can have... Jack Buckhorn. Jack, Jack, come on up. We have all three of you up at the same time. So, Go ahead. Um, Hello again, board members. Just to, 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 first of all, I just want to say, Joseph sort of um, preempted me a little bit. I did want to say <laughs> <laughs> that this um, particular item is coming to our academic senate plenary session, where it'll be before all 114, 72 uh, senate presidents that will be there to vote and to endorse the work here. I will say thank you to the California Apprenticeship Council. They have been really wonderful to work with on this. We built a relationship that was really solid, and 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 my. Uh, uh, my couple of my executive committee members worked really very hard to get us to this place. I'm going to have John give you a few more specifics on some of the questions that you had because he was also involved in the effort. Yes. <laughs> president Estelano, Chancellor Oakley, board members. I'm John Stanskis. I'm the vice president of the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges. Um, I did want to, to address the uh, question about the qualifications because uh, in our work with the California Apprenticeship Council, um, apprenticeship instructors um, are um, a little bit different in ed code and they're defined a little differently about their, their role with the community colleges. And a lot of our apprenticeship uh, programs, uh, well, all of them that are represented by the California Apprenticeship Council are funded differently as well. They're funded through related supplemental instruction money. Um, and it was the agreement that the uh, well-established apprenticeship programs that have been around longer than the community colleges have a mechanism through their professional development and their training um, of uh, potential apprenticeship instructors um, that meets or exceeds the, the necessary requirements to award college credit um, here. And so when we're talking about those instructors in apprenticeship programs, um, the experience is really most important for apprenticeship because that's really what the, the student needs access to the most. Mr. Buckhorn. Great. Good morning, uh, President Estelano, Chancellor and board members. My name is Jack Buckhorn. I am the chairman of the California Apprenticeship Council and was involved in much of the discussion and negotiations that took place over the last year and a half or so. And I just have a brief statement that I would like to read into the record. Um, the CAC was established by the Shelley Maoney Act, um, Apprenticeship Labor Standards Act of 1939. 
appointed by the governor, the council meets quarterly to conduct business of apprenticeship in, in California and fulfill its statutory requirements and responsibilities to provide <laughs> policy advice on apprenticeship matters to the director of the Department of Industrial Relations. Um, we issue rules and regulations on specific apprenticeship subjects and publish in the California Code of Regulations and conduct appeal hearings. So that's basically what our, our job is. At their April 27, 2017 meeting, the CAC authorized a six-person ad hoc committee to review and discuss updates proposed for apprenticeship instructor minimum qualifications. When setting minimum instructor qualification for apprentices, Education Code 87357 subdivision A1 directs uh, the Board of Governors to, quote, consult and rely pri primarily upon the advice and judgment of appropriate apprenticeship faculty and labor organization representatives. The CAC ad hoc met many times with uh, Dr. Lynn Shaw from the Chancellor's Office. We also worked closely with John Freitas and Lorraine Slatery uh, Farrell from the Academic Senate to address several, several of their concerns. Uh, accordingly, our committee is in full support of the apprenticeship minimum instructor qualifications before you today. And just quickly, a little bit about me. So I'm, I'm an electrician, and I went through an apprenticeship program uh, through uh, Santa Rosa Junior College. Mm -hmm. And uh, I graduated, I worked my way as, as a journeyman electrician, and eventually became a training director for our apprenticeship program and an apprenticeship instructor. And the apprenticeship community, uh, we teach our skills. I mean, we make our money based on skills, on what we can do on the job in the best way. And really the only way to be able to provide that knowledge to pass it on down is from a skilled journey level, um, electrician, carpenter, laborer, roofer, you name it. That's how we do it. I also went to the University of Tennessee to learn how to teach adults. 30 learn seconds. All the things that we need to be successful as, as an adult teacher. We take this very seriously, and I want to just personally thank uh, the Chancellor's Office as well as the Academic Senate for really working very closely with us to solve um, this problem. It wasn't a problem. To, to make a better regulation that will help us uh, into the future and support apprenticeship for many, many more years to come. So thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Mr. Buckhorn. Any questions from Board of Governors? Mr. Buckhorn, can you guys sit for a second? I have a question. How long did it take us to resolve this? <laughs> you really want to know? I do. I really do want to know. <laughs> well, we started before April of 2017. That was when we actually put the ad hoc together. But we'd been discussing this for, oh, I'd have to go back in the record, but probably a year before that, trying to, to come to some kind of um, census on how we would move forward. And, and to be honest, there was a struggle between whose responsibility it really was. The apprenticeship community felt like um, the chancellor's office or the academic senate or other folks were making these decisions without input from the apprenticeship community. So there was a lot. We had to deal with some things locally in our apprenticeship community. And I, I can't thank uh, the chancellor's office and the academic senate uh, enough, to be honest, to really um, bring some stability to the process. And really, we each, I believe, now understand what our roles are and how important it is that we have this symbiotic relationship and we work closely together to make sure that we provide the very best training and education for those that seek, um, I guess, their entry into the middle class through uh, apprenticeship programs of all types. Um, so again, that, it took a long time, but I, I don't think the next time will be quite as far. That's and we're going to K-12 next. So believe me. <laughs> That'll uh, take three times as long. Well, we'll okay, see. you know, <laughs> we learned some things. And I'll just we'll say that it really, it was, there was some tension, but we were able to work through it. And it's a good partnership now. It's really solid. And in fact, um, their folks are coming to our plenary session Great. and we're going to their, uh, their conferences. And so it's really, and there's, we've increased the understanding and it's, it, it really is faculty to faculty having these conversations and doing what's in the best interest of our students. So even though it took a little bit of time, we are now in a really good place. So um, I really appreciate all the work from everybody that it's gone into this, just this one thing. But we'll right. move forward in that partnership. Also. Well, I just think that's very important because if we're going to hit our goals on credentialing and apprenticeship, we really need our systems to work together. So Lynn, I'm glad to see you nodding back there too. So I'm sure this came out of the strong workforce process and I'm glad to see that it's been resolved. So thank you all. Um, 
And I don't think we take a vote at this point. We're just in a first reading. So we will have this come back to us in May. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, next up is item 3.2, which is apportionment for non-credit courses. I must say, um, Mr. Leforcier, I really enjoyed, I guess in a way enjoyed reading the staff report. It was just a, a reminder of the history over the last 20 years of our state and dealing with immigration. So quite an evolution. Okay, so this is... Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, Mark LaForest, J. General Counsel, once again. Uh, the purpose of this regulatory change is to remove from Title V a prohibition against community college districts claiming apportionment for undocumented students taking non-credit classes. As explained in detail in the agenda item, this prohibition is a holdover from an era in California policy during which the use of public resources to support the education of undocumented people was disfavored. There's no provision in California law that requires the Board of Governors to maintain this regulation. So we propose to remove it, and we think that's in keeping with uh, current California policy and the recent passage of Senate Bill 68, which uh, authorizes the use of non-credit coursework for non-resident tuition exemption. That. Are there any questions? Okay, members of the Board of Governors, Mr. Board Member Belansky, please. Not a question, but a comment based upon a statement in here where it says, because no tuition is charged for non-credit courses, there may be no basis for colleges to ask about a student's immigration status. And the other thing that could be tied with that that was very helpful is many districts that have credit and non-credit have two applications. Correct and that the application for non-credit has fewer questions, fewer information, so this is great. Great. Any other questions from members of the board? Right. Yeah, please, Board Member Oakley. I mean, Chancellor <coughs> Oakley. Um, Sorry about that. I, I just want to uh, take a moment, as this is a first reading, just to thank the board for the tone it's been setting on issues uh, related to undocumented students. I think it's worth noting that... Um, you know, part of this proposal is to change the way it's entitled from alien student, which just boggles my mind that um, we ever use that term, uh, to um, apportionment for non-credit courses. So I want to also thank the general counsel for identifying this and bringing it forward. Welcome. Great. If there are any other further questions, this will come back to us on May in a second reading. And thank you very much for your work. Oh, oh, Mr. Board Member Baum. And again, yeah. we have the authority to do this. We don't. It doesn't need a legislative remedy. That is correct. That's correct. This was originally in statute. Um, it was placed into the board regulations in Title IX a number of years ago. But there's no continuing restraint on our amending our regulations. Fabulous. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, um, now we're going on to item 4.1. These are information items. The first is of great import. Um, we're going to welcome Vice Chancellor Osmeña to the dais. We're going to hear about the update on the proposed funding formula and related discussions. Please tell us all about it, Chris. Okay, I'm sure. As uh, Vice Chancellor Osmeña prepares his slides, I just want to take a moment again to thank everybody who's been giving us input on this issue and just reiterate that while uh, we appreciate that the Department of Finance has put forward their proposal, uh, which we think is very well intended, we recognize that there are some things that, are, that we feel need to be clarified and improved upon. So we're out to the field trying to make those improvements and make sure that at the heart of this proposal, is improving the lives of our students and finding ways to ensure that the resources that we're providing our colleges follow the needs of our students, particularly those students who are not well represented um, in uh, the outcomes at some of our colleges. So with that, I'll turn it over to Vice Perfect. Chancellor Osmeña. Thank you very much, President Estolano and members. I'm Christian Osmeña, Vice Chancellor for Finance and Facilities Planning. Uh, as the president mentioned, this item is an informational item only. It is a follow-up to the budget overview presented at your last meeting to keep you informed about this ongoing discussion and to prepare you for actions that this board may need to consider in the future. The slides are intended to frame the discussion. I hope you'll see the links to the vision of success, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Excuse, one, one moment. Yes, board member Walker Griffin. 
Oh, I'm just going to wait for comments on this, but you Okay, can you're like jumping the line. It's good. You're you're <laughs> eager. I love it. Okay. Keep going, Mr. Osmini. And the fancy transitions that I didn't realize were in the slides. Um, I'll begin by speaking briefly about our system's current practice. The general apportionment is the main source of operating revenues for the colleges, and the state calculates a total entitlement for each district. That is, amount is funded first with property taxes and student fees, with the remainder funded by state general fund appropriations. A district's entitlement is calculated largely based on the district's current entitlement, generally adjusted by enrollment growth and changes in the cost of living as specified in the annual budget act. A district earns these funds by achieving necessary enrollment with funding rates specified for three different kinds of enrollment. A district also receives funds based on the number of colleges and centers in the district and for some other characteristic. Finally, separate from the general apportionment, the state funds many categorical programs. About one-third of state funds are appropriated through categorical programs. These include student services categorical programs, such as the Student Success and Support Program, Economic and Workforce Development Programs, such as the Strong Workforce Program, and others. This chart simply shows the magnitude of funds in each category. The state funds the general apportionment the state funds for the general apportionment, along with the property taxes and student fees, total more than $6 billion, and they are allocated using the existing FTES-based funding formula. The categorical programs, about $1.3 billion, are allocated and restricted based on the provisions of dozens of individual programs. Our office and others have noted two main challenges that might be addressed by changes in the funding formula. First, as you know, while the system has improved outcomes in recent years, serious challenges remain. These, out, uh, these challenges were articulated clearly in the vision for success, and your vision goals re represent an important Im uh, impetus for change. Second, a system focused so squarely on enrollment can create perverse incentives to spend in ways that might not serve the system's primary missions. For example, by encouraging certain kinds of marketing and program offerings. This conversation is not new to the system. Last year, Chancellor Oakley asked the Advisory Work Group on Fiscal Affairs, a standing body that advises our office on finance issues, to consider changes to the formula that would support the vision and address operational needs of the colleges. That group's recommendations included a vision statement that I think you, uh, includes a useful framing as you uh, engage in this discussion. They propose that a new formula should be stable and sustainable, support the vision for success goals, encourage progress for those historically underserved by the system, and respond to the needs of the communities. I'd suggest a fifth as we engage in these discussions, that a new formula be transparent, that would be simple enough to explain and understand easily. I'll move now to the governor's proposal. As discussed at your last meeting, the governor's budget proposes a new formula for use beginning in 2018-19. That formula consists of three general categories of funding. First, the base grant would be similar to the existing system, with funding allocated based on the number of full-time equivalent students multiplied by a funding rate linked to the existing rates. The governor intends that statewide this amount would uh, cover half of all funds allocated. Second, a supplemental grant would be linked to the number of low-income students enrolled. The governor uses two measures, the number of students who receive a College Promise Grant and the number of students who receive a Pell Grant. This would account for a quarter of all funds. And third, the Student Success Incentive Grant would be based on three outcomes, the number of degrees and certificates awarded, the number of associate degrees for transfers awarded, and the number of students who complete a degree or certificate, certificate in three years or less. The governor proposes a hold harmless provision, that is, in the in the first year, a district would receive no less than the total amount of funding the district received in 2017-18, and moving forward, a district would receive no less than the per student funding the district received in 2017-18. This slide is intended to convey more specifically the mechanics of the formula. Essentially, the governor's proposal has eight initial calculations. To get a district's funding, we would multiply the variable count, which is the second column shown on that slide, by the rate, which is the third column, for each of the lines. After that, we would add the total togethers, and that total amount would be the district's entitlement. Again, the entitlement would be funded by a combination of state funds, property taxes, and student fees. 
The governor's proposal includes some provisions that are of interest to our office. First, the Board of Governors would be able to amend the formula with approval from the Department of Finance. We believe the authority is important because it would, uh, would allow us to learn from initial implementation and correct unintended consequences. Second, districts would be required to amend their educational master plans to align with the vision for success. And third, the chancellor could direct districts that are identified as needing assistance in meeting those goals to use up to 3% of the funds for technical assistance. The governor's budget also asks our office to consult with stakeholders to create a proposal to, to consolidate categorical programs for consideration in the May revision. We think this is an important conversation to have because it can help coordinate incentives across programs. As the chancellor mentioned, we've engaged in a number of stakeholder processes to review these proposals. Following the release of the governor's budget, the chancellor asked the president of the CEO board to convene a working group to consider the governor's proposal and make recommendations for improvements. I want to acknowledge the amount of time that the members of that group and the league staff have spent on this work. In addition, the chancellor asked the advisory work group on fiscal affairs to continue their, continue their work and consider how a new formula might be implemented. Last week, both groups presented a joint recommendation to the consultation council. Their recommendations address similar issues to the governor's proposal. The recommendations include a two-year transition period similar to the governor's one-year hold harmless. Beginning in the third year, the, uh, the work groups recommend, in recommend implementation of a new formula, which in the fifth year of implementation would result in 25% of the resources being allocated to districts using a set of performance outcomes. Their recommendations also embed equity measures into the calculation, providing districts with additional funds for outcomes of economically disadvantaged students. And finally, the work group uh, proposes consolidating three large existing categorical programs, the Student Success and Support Program, the Student Equity Program, and the Basic uh, Skills Program into a single source of funds. As discussed, these issues were presented to Consultation Council last week, and the Chancellor's Office and the work groups received additional feedback from that group. Our office has also sought feedback from other groups. Beginning later this week, we will co-host with the Campaign for College Opportunity three stakeholder meet meetings to get feedback about how a new funding formula can address issues around equity. And the Chancellor has disseminated two surveys, one on the funding formula and the other on categorical programs broadly across the systems. I'll close the formal presentation by talking about next steps. The legislature begins consideration of the budget in earnest this week. As you're aware, tomorrow the Assembly Budget Subcommittee on Education and the Higher Education Committee will meet to discuss both the online college and the funding formula. The Senate Budget Subcommittee on Education will consider the funding formula on April 19th. Our office intends to make recommendations for changes to the governor's proposal based on recommendations from the work groups and others for consideration as part of the governor's May revision. The May revision, as many of you know, begins the feverish race to enactment of the final budget. The legislature is required to pass a budget by June 15th with a July 1st uh, beginning of the fiscal year. And to the extent changes are made in this budget, we will likely bring proposed actions to the board shortly thereafter. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Mr. Osmania. I think, um, why don't we start with public comments, because we have quite a bit of them, and I think it can maybe help the board craft up their opinion. You okay with that, Board Member Walker Griffin? Okay. Vice President Epstein. Okay, uh, first up, I'll ask for three of you, Adam Wetzman, Omar Oiwela, and Lynette Miyaga. Please uh, all come up to the table, and then as each of you finish, uh, the Vice President will name another person to come up, and we can switch out, so keep it moving. And uh, as you know, limit our comments to three minutes. Okay. Good morning. I think it's still morning, and thank you. Good morning. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to thank the, uh, uh, the Chancellor's Office for uh, having opportunity for all the stakeholders to engage in dialogue relating to uh, the funding formula. So we had uh, meetings last week, and, and, and that was a very good conversation. Uh, and, and certainly we all have the same goals. We want students to be successful in their academic endeavors, and we want them to move through efficiently, but efficiently based upon 
their specific circumstances, which vary from student to student, and we certainly know that, that many of our students have challenges. We all, as faculty representatives, have uh, concerns with performance-based funding when we are measuring outcomes of student performance, because what the research shows is that it just doesn't work. We uh, are distributing this report here, which talks about performance-based funding, and not only does it really not yield those metrics that systems are seeking, but it often has very significant negative consequences as well, such as shutting down opportunities for those students that are in most need of our services. So we are opposed to performance-based funding. We do have other suggestions. One of those is the proposal that has been made by FAC, and that is in our budget letter, which uh, we also are distributing. And on page three of that budget letter, we have an alternative proposal. That is to have a blended formula with some of the funds coming from FTEs, kind of like it traditionally does. A second part of that would be 25% of the funding, which be, would be addressing those students that are most in need of our services, such as those who are low-income students as measured by Promise Grants and Pell Grants, uh, participation in other uh, programs such as Foster Youth and participation in DSPS, et cetera. And then the final portion of it is based upon metrics that we know are successful, and that includes supporting faculty. We know as a system that we do not have enough full-time faculty. We know as a system that we need to provide more support for part-time faculty. And there is ample evidence to support that, and that is the third document that we're giving you, which provides a great deal of research which shows that supporting faculty will lead to those outcomes for students that will give them the opportunity to be successful. Uh, also, we have lots of programs in the works right now. There's a lot of changing going on at the community college level, which includes things like the vision, guided pathways, and AB 705. We will move those metrics, but the best way to move those metrics is not through performance-based funding, but instead through these other mechanisms, which we have just outlined. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, President Estolano, Chancellor Oakley, members of the board. My name is Omar Orihuela. I'm the incoming president of the EOPS Association, Extended Opportunities, Programs, and Services. Let me start by addressing the new members of the governing board. Um, I want to congratulate you on your appointment, and I look forward to working with each one of you in the upcoming years. Second, uh, the e e Extended Opportunities, Programs, and Services is geared towards helping the most economically and academically disadvantaged students in the community college system. EOPS recruits and seeks out the student population to provide intrusive academic counseling services, tutoring, assisting with critical resources, hire faculty that represents them, and help them persist towards transfer and graduation. We are thankful of your continued support towards EOPS. Your commitment to our students, which are veterans, uh, students with disability, DACA or EB 540, foster youth, single parents, or formerly incarcerated is key to our success at every college. We want to thank Chancellor Oakley for his commitment to keep EOPS out of the consolidation language. We are excited to see the expansion to more districts of KFIS or Next Stop programs under the EOPS umbrella, and today we are heading to the capital to seek funding for this expansion. Once again, we thank you for your leadership and support to EOPS, CARE, KFIS, and Next Stop. Thank you. And can we invite up uh, Adam Wetzman and, no, oh, sorry, not Adam. Uh, <laughs> I'll speak again. <laughs> Larry, Larry Galizio and, um, and Julie Bruno. Go ahead, Lynette. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to report what Adam said and also to thank the Chancellor's Office and particularly the Chancellor and Christian Osmeña for facilitating discussions that were very productive and very helpful. I would like to address just a, a separate underlying issue here, and this is the issue of equity. When you fund according to numbers of degrees and certificates, the actual 
outcome is that students, underrepresented students, the students who need our help the most, are the ones who get hurt. That is why the proposal for the, the completion proposal of the 25%, I believe, is misguided. I don't think that um, people who looked at it really understand our students and work with our students on a regular basis. So I, I am very concerned about the impact because if you have 25% of your budget and you don't get very many degrees and certificates achieved, then your budget takes a hit. And that's exactly what we don't need. And the second equity issue is diverse faculty. Adam's materials that you will see um, supports the hiring of full-time faculty and acts, asks that we include that into the metrics for the funding formula. As we hire full-time faculty, we have new EEO procedures which make it more likely that we will have faculty of color hired into our colleges and we know because this, our, our former chief counsel here in the chancellor's office presented data to you showing that when students have faculty who look like them and come from their backgrounds, that they persist and succeed at higher rates. So for these two equity reasons, one, students under the funding formula, and two, hiring a full-time faculty with greater diversity, I, I strongly urge you to think about this funding formula and oppose the performance-based funding seconds. portion. Thank you. Uh, President Estolano, Vice President Epstein, uh, members of the board, Chancellor Oakley, and, and uh, welcome to the new members of the board. This is, obvious, this is a very exciting time to be, and uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. So uh, number one is I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that the community, well, and I should say, the Community College League is a membership organization statewide, and we have uh, two, bo uh, two, two boards, one made up of the 440, well, re those representing the 441 trustees uh, statewide, and then we have a board made up of chancellors and presidents who represent 137 or so CEOs throughout the state of California. So um, number one, I wanted to make sure that people were aware that the league has a, on its website, uh, under the resources tab, uh, funding formula, work group, there, is, there are materials there, including letters from stakeholders and um, constant updates. So I th we, we think it's a very useful source of information for anyone who wants to keep up to date on what's happening, at least with the, with the CEO work group that's been tasked by the chancellor. And I, wanna, I do want to thank Chancellor Oakley for his openness and also Vice Chancellor uh, Osmania for the hours that he has put in. And I hope I don't get him in trouble to say that even before he was officially on board, he was already coming to our meetings. Um, if he gets in trouble, Come talk to me later. I'll see what I can help you. But uh, he's been phenomenally helpful. I also want to thank and recognize the members of the CEO board. It's kind of a thankless job. Uh, we, we handed out flak jackets. Uh, their names are listed on that website. Uh, but they do encourage uh, you communicating with them, uh, anybody that wants to provide input and, and insight. I also wanted to recognize the league's vice president, Lizette Navarrete, who has done a phenomenal job uh, helping to support the work group. Now, I wanted to, uh, Vice Chancellor Osmini has discussed the CEO and the CBO's recommendation, and I wanted to make it very clear on behalf of the CEO work group that that is a draft recommendation, and until the simulations are run, uh, with those particular metrics seconds. that are recognized, it, again, it's it's merely a draft. Okay, this is an iterative process, so it's it's a draft until we see simulations run. Uh, you know that's going to be really important. The last thing I would say is, with the current funding formula, 32 districts in our state are in stability, 80 million dollars 
of growth dollars were left on the table over the last two years. There's a wonderful new book, and I know I have two seconds left, uh, talking about demographics and higher education, and they refer to a demographic storm. So in terms of just a formula based on growth, uh, it, that in and itself is quite a challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Yes, um, President Estelano, board members, again, thank you so much. Um, I will echo my colleagues' comments. Um, the conversations that we've been having around the table at consultation, the CEOs have been engaged in, our CBOs, chief business officers, um, it's been faculty, the faculty groups have come together to talk about it. It's been really wonderful to sort of engage in some deep conversations, and we very much appreciate Chancellor Oakley and um, Christians help with all of that and, and, and being open to all of it. Um, we did have the conversation at consultation. There were four experts that came to address us to really talk about the implications of some of these provisions in the funding formula. Um, it was fairly uh, clear at that point that performance-based funding we know does not work in the way that it is intended and the Senate does have a position against it. We do know, however, that if we support students in the right way, they will get to their educational goal. So I think that's really where, um, from our perspective, that's where we need to focus to make sure that they have this, the services um, and the support necessary. So. Uh, my, my dear colleague Lynette touched on the fact of full-time faculty being critical to this effort, and, and, and I will say the same things. Um, we would very much like to have that consideration as you deliberate around this funding formula. The board has been very supportive of hiring full-time faculty now for many years. It's been included in the budget proposal. If there was a way that we can include that in the funding formula so that we ensure that we have the full-time faculty that we need to implement guided pathways, to implement AB 705, to do all this really good work that we're doing at our colleges, that would be really significant. The other thing, and, and again, Lynette, I've been preempted frequently today. Lynette talked about is the diversity. We have been really trying to make sure that our faculty ranks actually reflect our student populations. We cannot get there by just hiring through attrition, through retirements. We need to make progress to ensure that 75% of our instruction is taught by full-time faculty and that those full-time faculty mirror our student population in diversity. So we really, doing, including full-time faculty hiring within the funding formula itself will actually get us to make that progress and we can achieve both of those, all of those goals um, because it will come down to full-time faculty in the classroom in their offices doing this work with our students. So again, thank you so much for allowing us to provide input on this. We very much appreciate it and we'll just keep, we'll just keep going until we figure this thing out, I suppose, or Oh, well, I won't be president in two years, so, um, <laughs> so thank you very much. And we have one last person, uh, Jeffrey Michaels. Thank you. Hi, um, members of the board and uh, chancellor. I'm Jeffrey Michaels. I am the president of the California Community College Independence and I teach English at Contra Costa College. It seems to me that we are at a turning point, um, and I just wanna say, I, I think the governor's budget proposal represents a significant threat to our students, and yet it opens the door to a terrific opportunity to come together as a system. We do need a new funding formula. We do need to make progress in a lot of the areas that we've started making progress on and started dialogue on, especially equity um, for our students, and. All of that is just very important. The research is overwhelming. I want to read you two sentences from a book that uh, Christian recommended to me, and I too have really appreciated his openness and dialogue. This is a, a recent research study. The extant research literature has largely found that performance-based funding has little impact on student incomes in, in outcomes. And not only doesn't it work in terms of affecting student outcomes, but Research shows that performance funding policies produce sizable unintended negative impacts. In practice and with the best intentions, throughout the country in other states, outcomes funding models limit the mission, shift resources to students who are more likely to succeed, away from students that need extra resources, limit institutional cooperation, reduce degree requirements and lower standards, Low, limit faculty voice in academic governance, lower morale, and cost money. It's just not a good approach. 
Personally, I dream of simple, stable funding. We could decouple the funding from FTES, benchmark everybody where they are now, and give every district a percentage of whatever increase or decrease in revenues Prop 98 creates. We would be able to do way better locally if we had simple, stable funding. But if we are moving to any kind of a more complex formula, we have to focus on capacity building. That's what all of these researchers suggest. And capacity building means building the capacity of the institutions to change. Outcomes-based funding is a bad idea, but any incentive-based funding requires the institutions to have the capacity to change. And I'm sorry, that's not about data sharing and technology. It is about full-time faculty. It is about a seconds. collaborative, participatory system of how we offer classes and make changes to classes. We don't have the human resources in place, the counselors, the full-time teachers, to make the kinds of changes that will really be meaningful to our students. So I completely support what other faculty have said. We need to make full-time faculty and professionalized part-time faculty a part of this conversation, and we need to address our capacity needs before we start talking about funding outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that it for speakers? Okay. Uh, Mr. Osmezina, any other thoughts you want to add before we go into questions? Just one maybe um, res or thought related to kind of this conversation about performance funding. I think one of the things that we have been clear about is, um, you know, I think there are uh, legitimate concerns that performance funding systems as they've been implemented in other contexts um, you know, I think you, uh, one might be concerned that you do have issues of, of which students are then uh, targeted by colleges for enrollment um, and that colleges may have an incentive to, to enroll students who are easy to uh, meet the outcomes that are desired. I think that's one thing that the chancellor has been clear about that in a new system that one thing we need to see is equity provisions, that we need to see a focus on additional resources for um, the students have been historically underserved by our students so, or by our colleges. So I think that's one thing that um, we are sensitive to and we think uh, in our recommendations to the Department of Finance, you know, I expect that we'd include something related to that. Thank you. Okay, so I've got a pretty big queue. I already have uh, members Walker, Griffin, Delili. I've got Shaw, Avalos, Polanski, Vaughn. Okay, it's a good starter set. <laughs> Board Member Walker Griffin. Thank you, President Esolano. Um, recently, I had the opportunity to speak with uh, several individuals in regards to this new budget proposal, and I kept hearing the same common notion that this is putting a lot of pressure on schools that are in less affluent areas to perform better. Now, that sounds good on paper, but we have to remember that schools that are in less affluent areas, such as mine, Contra Costa, it's over in Richmond, there's not a lot of students who are full time equivalent. So, one, you're holding the money over the school's head saying, if you can jump, you can get it but it's hurting the students more than anything else. And once that uh, pot of money begins to drain, it becomes a lot more harder for schools to create the resources that students need. And in addition to that, um, where, it where it mentions the number of students who complete a degree or certificate in three years or less, that's really hard. So right now, 12 units, I believe, is full-time equivalent. For many students, that's pretty hard to obtain. If you're taking, for example, in um, the field I'm studying, political science, most classes are three units, so that's four classes. That means you're on campus for at least four to five hours throughout the day. That's a long time, considering that a lot of schools, the average age of a student is 21, so that means the person is working full time. So I just wanted to um, reiterate that point that some of my colleagues mentioned, that I believe that this is sort of, I don't want to say a messed up proposal, but I think that it could be looked at a little bit better. Um, <laughs> because plain and simple, I don't want schools that historically perform a little bit weaker than the more affluent schools. Um, another example of that is Diablo Valley College, which sits over in Pleasant Hill, which is a sister school to Contra Costa. Now, in that area, it serves students in Lafayette, Orinda, Walnut Creek, where the average income is well above $100,000. But then you travel 20 minutes west to Contra Costa, a lot of students live in poverty. So who's going to do better, the schools over in Central County at DVC or CCC? Historically, it's been DVC. So I just wanted to note that point. Thank you. Board Member DeLeely, followed by Board Member Shaw. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, all the members of the public who came and spoke, and uh, thank our Chancellor for the bold idea. I think these 
uh, types of conversations is what's going to make our uh, already wonderful system even better. Uh, I just had a very quick question. I saw on the slides that the uh, equity consultation councils are uh, convening three times in the next, uh, I think, range of month. Have they met yet? And if so, uh, what has been some feedback? They haven't. The first have meeting is Wednesday, and then the, there are two meetings next week on Monday and Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Board Member Shaw, followed by Board Member Avalos. Okay. Um, two phrases were mentioned, the unintended consequences of this, this action and also the pitfalls of performance-based funding. I, I agree with uh, our speakers um, and, our, and our board member who, who talked about the, 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 the difference between the poor communities and the, and the wealthier communities. So I have a question. My question is, what is has been the governor's response to these comments, particularly our last speaker, and the, the books and the, the the literature that that point to the fact that uh, performance based uh, funding has not been successful? Why are we Why are they proposing that? I, I don't understand. I hesitate to speak uh, for them. Um, I'll make two points that I think um, you know they've raised in, in other contexts. One is that you know I think they would not necessarily characterize their proposal as a performance funding formula akin to what's been adop adopted in other states. That you know the first quarter um, you know there's the co uh, half of it's based you know on the existing practices around FTES. That next quarter is more, I think, in their mind, like the local control funding formula in K-12 schools, that it's based on the enrollment of um, students from particular groups that the state has identified as, um, as appropriate for additional resources. And so in this context, um, it would be uh, Pell, L or Pell recipients and uh, College Promise Grant recipients. And so I think that is really uh, an extension, I think, in their view of the work that has been done in school finance reform around the local control funding formula. And I think the last part, you know, I think their response and, and the logic that um, is inherent in a lot of performance funding systems is around linking uh, uh, measures of funding to goals that have been set by the state. And so in the governor's budget summary, they talk about the goals that this board has adopted and the vision for success and that, um, uh, part of achieving those kinds of goals is aligning incentives across programs. And so this would be one way of aligning ins incentives consistent with the board's actions. But, but having incentives without having capacity, I don't understand that. In other words, you have incentives for these institutions that don't have the capacity. And I think, um, you know, I think our response would be we've, you know, we've testified um, this year that, you know, we think overall there should be additional resources, but I, you know, I think, um, you know, I, my my sense would be the administration's argument is um, you can have both conversations at the same time. If I can add to your question, Board Member Shaw, because I think it's an important question on several um, several areas. You know, first, let me be clear: what the Department of Finance has proposed uh, would hardly be considered a performance-based funding formula because only 25% of the funding currently would be tied to some outcome. The rest uh, tries to follow the logic that was implemented with the local control funding formula. So yes, there is a question on the last 25%. What is the best way to align the incentives? And that is exactly what we're talking about, and I think the administration is very open to that conversation. But I'd also remind us that under the current funding formula, which is an outcomes-based formula, the outcome is enrollment. Um, over six years, less than half of our students complete. And if you break it down by ethnicity, that's even a worse number. So I think we have to begin from the point of view that what we're doing is not in any way, shape, or form working for any Californian. Period. Uh, and I think the onus needs to be on providing additional support to colleges that do serve underrepresented communities. That's why we're trying to place a premium on colleges that enroll underrepresented students, whether you measure them by Pell eligibility or Perkins eligibility or any of one of a number of metrics. That is the core here. 
Um, so yes, there are concerns about that last 25 percent, and we are very much open to working with our colleagues to improve that measure. Um, I don't. Um, uh, uh, I, I think the literature that is available speaks to both what could be used to improve a performance-based funding formula and what metrics do move the needle best. Uh, we recognize all that body of literature and we're trying to create a funding formula that does resolve the issues that you're talking about. But at the end of the day, if we continue with the current funding formula, we have well over half of our colleges who are declining in enrollment. Uh, we only have completion measures that over six years, not three, six, uh, less than half of our students complete any meaningful credential. So that is what we're trying to resolve. And uh, we're happy to and will continue to engage with Californians across the state to find a better way to align those incentives. But you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. We don't want those unintended consequences, which is also why we're asking that the Board of Governors retain the authority to look at those measures to ensure that whatever measures we come up with, you as a body can have the authority to continue to change them to ensure that we're aligning the funding with the vision for success. Well, I, I, I hear you and I agree with what you're saying particularly about the, the final 25%, because I think that money, if, if that formula is not clear, then that money can be skewed to the more fortunate communities. We, we agree. And so hopefully we can work th through that. Okay. Board thank Member you. Avalos followed by Board Member Volansky. Uh, Christian, thank you very much for all the work you've done so far. So to me, I, I heard a couple of things that I just I have to touch on, which is, you know, question of equity a question of who gets hurt and what's not working. When I look at the numbers of completion for African Americans, 64% don't complete in the system. That's right. For Hispanics, 59% don't complete in the system. That is an issue of equity to me now. And the current system as it stands, it's not working, right? I've been on this board for four years. We spent over $2 billion in triple SP and also equity combined. And have we seen fundamental change? No. So that's not working. And the fact that someone is thinking bold and we're thinking something different and yet we hear we're going to get hurt, but people are already getting hurt. The fact that 64% African Americans are not completing and for African American male, it's even worse for Hispanic males, even worse. So to me, that's not working. So I applaud your work on this. I applaud the chancellor's work on this and the governor's work on this because at the end of the day, it is an equity issue. And at the end of the day, we have to think about things differently. And since I've been on this board, I've been waiting for something like this because this is challenging the status quo. And we as a group, not only as a board, but also as a larger community, stakeholders included, we have to figure out a better way. Thank you. Board Member Belansky, followed by Board Member Fon. I want to start by asking a question and then I'll make a comment because I want to make sure I understand the terms. When it says consider the consolidation of categorical programs, what does that mean? <clears throat> Uh, from the perspective of our office, I think we would offer up a recommendation of um, which programs and then uh, what provisions would a new program be uh, subject to, both in terms of allocation and then how the funds are used. And the reason I raise the question as to what consolidation means is based upon past work experience. One of the categorical programs, and it's been mentioned briefly as we know, is services for students with disabilities. DSPNS. And because the money is allocated in a certain way, that money is there. It isn't a college decision that we're going to have to put so much money in here to help our students with disabilities. And yet because the services to students with disabilities, more of them succeed. And, and get degrees, get certificates. So I worry that as we do this, we don't look at all of the different kinds of factors that have to be factored in and looked at. Um, and that one to me is, is critical, uh, that 
services are there for our students with disabilities. A quick question on number two. Um, is there a threshold for students that the students have to meet in order to receive the Pell Grant or the Bach uh, waiver, which is now called the Promise Grant? Is there a particular number, dollar amount, that a family or a student must have, must receive? Of, uh, for the, I'll start with the Pell Grant, there is a, um, and it's linked to EFC and the cost of attendance. I don't have off the top of my head, and I'm looking at Rhonda if she can help, but I don't have the, the particular EFC um, for, for this year, but we can follow up with that also. I, I, I think we should get that number. I think yeah. it's really important. People understand that the second factor is all about low-income students. And so to say that 25% that's targeted for low-income, the most disadvantaged students in our system, is somehow related to performance metrics in an inappropriate way is really galling to me. So we really need to, uh, for every member of the board to understand what it means to be a Pell Grant recipient and what it means to be a recipient for the Promise programs. Let's talk about incomes. And if you guys have to come back to us after the break, let's do it. But I want everybody on this board to understand the incomes that we're talking about. This is not a concept. This is not abstract. These are about people who are very poor. The and I don't know what an EFC is, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> I've been on the board for four years, too, man. Come on. How many are you? For, good morning. Rhonda Moore, Vice Chancellor of Student Services. Just uh, it, I can certainly try to come back with some income um, cutoffs. The, the, the formula for calculating an expected family contribution, um, which is used to compare with the cost of attendance to determine financial need, is very, very complicated. So there's a different income cutoff for a family of six than there is for a family of three. There's a different income <coughs> cutoff for a family of three who has a large um, business. Um, compare, uh, and, and the business, it makes it even more complicated because it, some business incomes are zero where the assets are, are very large. So it would, be, it would be difficult at most to come out come up with a cutoff for um, the Pell Grant, for the Promise Grant. Most families who qualify are below 85,000 per year, and that's up, you know, uh, um, probably four to six people in the household. We're a family of four. S Correct. So, so that's kind of my point. Let's say if there's a family in the Bay Area, city of San Francisco, That's or four. LA. And they, because of cost of living and their family makes 100 or 120 in order to survive in those communities. And here we're basing that college um, apportionment or um, revenue based on their student not or receiving the uh, promise grant, then that could be a problem for that college. I'm not talking about ethnic groups, I'm not talking about racial um, categorization, but I'm talking about colleges. So that's uh, my point in asking for that, that number. A college in communities that are very uh, expensive to live will basically be um, uh, be detriment based on bullet number two, in my view, unless I uh, there's something that I don't understand with with the solely on receiving Pell Grant and and uh, um, Promise Grant and the fact that this is actual students receiving. If a student who wishes to take one or two courses and seek not although qualified, but seek not to receive the Pell Grant or the Promise Grant, does that mean that college is not going to receive funding? That's correct. And I think the, um, the rationale there is that part of what um, an incentive that we might want to create in a new formula, and we think we should create a new funding formula, is to get students the financial aid that they're eligible for. And so, um, you know, I think there is an intentional decision to focus on recipients, um, but uh, happy to talk about that more. I think your initial point is, um, you know, I understand it to be around uh, 
how we think about need um, differs based on what community a student's from, and I think that's a, um, you know, I think that's something we certainly recognize. One of the challenges we've been trying to figure figure out is how do you balance, um, you know, our the measures that we're using in the formula with a formula that is transparent, easy to understand, and, and in some cases, um, you know, uh, feasible to implement. My second observation <clears throat> is on number three. So at a practical level, when if this gets uh, pushed out into the field and the CEO of a college tells faculty and everyone on campus that, okay, we're now performance-based, 25% of uh, our funding is based on performance-based, so let's get these students to pass the classes and obtain those degrees. So I think this will probably be instilled in faculty's mind, but certainly it will be in my mind to make sure that my students pass. But there, I don't know, are there faculty out there? Hmm, you're on the borderline, but since the CEO says, hey, let's pass these uh, students, C minus being passed when the student is not a C minus. I'm just afraid that in the practicality of instruction that this is the unintended consequences that um, that that this particular item, uh, the bullet pull, pull point number three, would uh, would take us, would lead us to. That's that's my biggest concern as a faculty. Not that I would do that, but that's a concern. Mm -hmm. Board Member Haynes, followed by Vice President Epstein. And before that, can I just summarize? So um, I think we can. Um, <laughs> You know, it's the calculation of the expected family contribution is complicated, but I think we can summarize relatively quickly um, kind of need across uh, kind of what it means to be needy according to that definition, and then also across our colleges, how do we see what the, uh, how that measure looks? I appreciate that. Uh, Board Member Haynes, followed by Vice President Epstein. Um, thank you. So I've um, sat listening. I really wanted to listen to the conversation. Um, and, and I have to say there are many good points. I think there, um, there is concern about changing the, the formula. Um, and I think we need to make certain that we try not to, where at all possible, um, that we really try to figure out the unintended consequences. Um, and, and in many cases, what I'm hoping is that there will be enough flexibility that as they come, that we'll, we will address them um, collaboratively. But I have to say, and I, and I really appreciated um, Board Member Avalos's comments, the status quo is completely unacceptable. Um, I've served on the Los Rios Board for 18 years. I'll be going into my 19th year. Um, um, I'm younger than I look. Um, my, my 19th year in a, in a couple of months, and um, um, I've had real concern when I've looked at, um, bef even before I, I, I got on this board, looked at um, the outcomes that have been posted on the, um, the chancellors relative to, in particular, students of color. We've just done a, an abysmally poor job. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that faculty and others um, are looking to, um, to do this without incentives um, or to be incentivized. But um, the, reality, the reality is there's been a lot of money put into our system over the last six years. Um, that has incentivized us to relook at our institutional structures and to what extent they are not serving students. Um, and so I, I guess I fall on the, I, I lean on the side of um, we've got to do something dramatic and different. If it doesn't work, then we can, we can move to adjust it and to, to change it. But to sit in status quo, um, if we put, if we say that students are at the center of every one of our decision-making processes, then we've got to say that we have not served many of them well. It's unacceptable for students not to complete in single-digit numbers over a significant amount of time. Um, and, and so, and it's, 
and it's not acceptable that a two year that was supposed to be a two year institution is now takes six years to complete. For those who do finally navigate our systems to complete, we have not made that process easy as well. So um, I'm going to I'm going to um, be on the side of supporting our students and making certain that we are looking at changes that will benefit them. If they don't, then we will come back to them and fix them. But I'm just unwilling to accept the status quo. And we have a couple of other rounds. Uh, board member Delaney and Board Member Shaw. Well, uh, Vice Chancellor Osman, yeah. Um, you certainly arrived at a very propitious time. You've got the, <laughs> the you know, your first uh, endeavor is to work on this is probably not the easiest uh, thing in the world. Um, I did have a question, uh, Member Belansky's uh, question about the consolidation of the categorical programs. I didn't really understand your answer. C could you tell me which categorical programs are being proposed for consolidation and which ones are not? There's no proposal from the governor. And so the governor's language says, um, look at categorical programs and come back to us with some ideas. So um, I think in... Um, you know, so there isn't a list. I think the list is kind of the categoricals that are funded in the budget. I think we certainly recognize that, um, you know, in the short term, both given limited time and just the capacity for change, I think, you know, we have narrowed it, uh, you know, internally our list. We've asked for um, feedback from stakeholders through a survey and through other forms. I think the three that the, uh, that the uh, CEOs and the CBOs identified um, were consistent with the ones that um, were talked about most frequently in, in the survey, um, tr uh, student support, um, student equity, and basic skills. And so I think those are where we are focusing our efforts uh, currently. Okay, and then that would be rolled into the total amount of money that's then being divided up under the 50-25-25 formula? Uh, that's also subject to um, uh, to discussion. So I, you know, I think that's open for kind of cons uh, continued consultation. I think one of the challenges of um, of rolling it in is that it then becomes subject to the set of regulations that govern um, govern that pot of general apportionment money. So I think um, that's something that over the next few weeks we'll continue uh, to to deliberate on. Okay. Um. I um, I share the concerns. I mean, I, I think a lot of people have made a lot of good points. I think the faculty has made a good point, and to you know be concerned about some of the performance-based funding uh, experiments in the past, and that uh, the addition of of more full-time faculty would be a great help to uh, to all of the, all of these students. Uh, but I also share the urgency that that many that the chancellor and several board members have uh, have uh, expressed about. The inadequacy of our performance to date, and the need for a, a pretty dramatic change. And so I, you know, I, I support this process. I think um, I think we do need to make the change. I like the idea that there's a lot of consultation going on. I think uh, I think the faculty concerns should certainly be addressed, and um, and where possible. Uh, you know, we can see if there is a way to improve the number of full-time faculty, but at the same time, we need to press forward with a, a uh, you know, a, a change that rewards uh, uh, colleges that are that are really addressing the concerns of uh, of lower income and minority populations and and helping them succeed in a reasonable period of time. Okay, um, Board Member Rawlings. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for the discussion. I think uh, this is uh, very informative for me. And, and Welcome coming to the board. From, yeah. in, yes, <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. And uh, coming from within the system as, uh, as a classified employee who deals uh, really right on the front line, um, I serve uh, in academic technology uh, at Mount San Antonio College, and uh, I work directly with our remedial learners. Right, and so I'm I'm seeing where students are having trouble achieving, and and the challenges that a lot of them face, and and so I'm very familiar with a lot of it. Uh, I would like to concur with uh, Board Member Haynes. Uh, I think the um, uh, the outcomes that we're getting are not serving the state well. I don't think they're serving our economy well. Um, I'm one of those students who didn't complete originally, uh, and uh, I've been able to to build a career off of the CTE. 
learning that I had, but I've also noticed the challenges that I faced through my career in trying to advance. So, so getting students to completion is, is very important. Uh, and I wonder what kinds of discussion have we had so far about the transition period where right now we're so focused on enrollment being the primary metric is the outcome that we're looking for and getting students into the system so they can try and reach to the point where they would achieve. As we move from that to this, this hybrid system where you're, you're de-emphasizing a little bit on the enrollment to emphasize other areas, uh, the transition period, uh, I think maybe it's, it just instinctually seems a little short um, with the amount of shifting that's going to have to happen at the local level where resources are placed. Uh, each uh, organization, I think, uh, budgets based on their priorities, and, and here our priorities are, are shifting a little bit to try and get a better outcome. But we're also requiring that the local colleges shift their priorities. And what kinds of discussion are we having about that transition period? And I've got a couple other follow-ups. Sure. I think, um, you know, as we think about a transition, there's probably two parts of this. One is that we... Um, you know, I think it would be concerning to have too dramatic of shifts in revenues in such a short period of time. And so I think both the, um, the Department of Finance proposal and the, the work by the CEO and CBO work groups helps to address some of that. Um, but I think your point is more around, um, you know, one of the things I think our office will need to take a role in is to work with colleges to provide some of the capacity building that was mentioned in public comment that I think we need to help colleges figure out how do you do well under a new performance or in, under a new funding formula. And so I think that's something that, um, you know, as this, it, it has not been um, admittedly um, a huge part of our conversation to date, but I think we have uh, in our work plan uh, have a point in time to the extent that something's enacted that we need to begin to think about then what kind of support are we uh, providing to the institutions. Then what type of, of data do we have or are there case studies or examples we have of uh, how you take um, an institution where there's there's an underperformance in, in certain demographics of students and get them to achieve. And what kind of models does that look like? Uh, I, I concur uh, fully with the faculty that uh, having more full-time faculty is, is a very big component we need to take a look at. I'd also uh, point out that the support that they're getting outside the classroom, which the full-time faculty do play a role in, but also with the classified, uh, the support that we're offering those students um, are there examples of how we can use those resources better than we are in order to achieve the outcomes we're trying to seek? Um, I think the answer is, the short answer is yes. I think there are examples I might turn to, I think many of my colleagues might have um, examples from work that, that this office has done in recent years with the institutional effectiveness work or more recent work around guided pathways, work around um, uh, AB 705 and changes to developmental education. So. If, if folks want to come up and, and we want to turn this into a longer answer, I'm happy, uh, you know, we, we very well, well can. But. While our <laughs> vice chancellor asks for volunteers from the gallery, I will say that uh, every proposal that we are bringing to you is intentional in its uh, connect, connection to the overall framework that we are putting into practice at our colleges, and that's the Guided Pathways Framework. So what we're trying to do is provide the capacity building through the work that we're doing in the Guided Pathways implementation. All of the conversations that we're having here should be ha being had at the 114 colleges. What is the right level of outside the classroom support versus inside the classroom support? How can we improve the professional development and the capacity building of our faculty? We want to do this in coordination. We don't want to create uh, momentum in, in silos. Uh, so it's very important, I, I think, to, to us in the chancellor's office and to a great extent to, to, to the board that we continue to drive that connection home. Um, and so, uh, we don't want to create um, or propose funding formula changes that take us, uh, that distract us from the implementation of the Guided Pathways Framework. We want to ensure that it connects to that and to the larger vision for success that you all have adopted. So um, uh, if we are true to the implementation of Guided Pathways and the questions you brought up um, will be asked at the local level. 
um, because we are asking colleges, even without this funding formula change, to rethink how they deploy their resources and what are the best ways to improve student outcomes for the 114 communities that we serve, because it's a little different in 114 communities. But the framework provides for that dialogue, for those metrics, for th that momentum to take place. So uh, your, your, your question is um, um, a, a great question, and it is, I think, the question that we need to be driving at this body consistently. How are these things connected, and how are the resources that the Board of Governors has responsibility over being directed toward um, uh, the investments that we've already made in the Guided Pathways Framework. Uh, first, I just wanted to say that as a former outreach ambassador, it excites me and energizes me uh, that an unintended consequence of this is outreach programs will now uh, be incentivized to focus on low-income students uh, something that my outreach office at El Camino College really focused on, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm very glad that that's going to be system-wide across our 114. Uh, a second question that I had that uh, Board Member Fawn slightly touched on uh, is with 25% of the funding based on the number of degrees, certificates, ADTs, are there any safeguards or has there been any discussion to ensure that our colleges aren't maybe reducing the, the rigor, the course load, or the number of requirements, and that we're able to, as a system, maintain our very high level of standards that we currently hold? Uh, the, uh, the framework in the budget suggests or says that for those um, under the governor's proposal, and I, I think under any iteration of these uh, conversations, that the uh, programs would be approved by the chancellor's office. We have an existing structure for approving uh, programs. I think one of the things that we need to do as we implement this is to figure out whether um, we do need to add additional safeguards. So I think it is on, in our, on our minds, and I think we will be having conversations about how do we use that approval process to make sure that we are, um, uh, we're only providing rewards for high value certificates and, and degrees. Board Member Shaw. Dramatic pause. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that, you know, all of us, every speaker that you've heard all realizes that, that there needs to be change. And I think that the core of, this, the, the, of what we're discussing is, will the change really impact people and improve the lives of people? Now, we realize the intention, you know, but what are going to be the consequences? So I think that the faculty's concerns need to be fully addressed, and that in order to be successful, their, their, their concerns must be incorporated, and, and we need to think that through. And um, in terms of Board Member Avalos mentioned the, uh, the state of the African American students. No, but I think no, maybe other than Board Member Haynes, really, I'm really, really aware of what's going on. And I spent actually my career in many instances, focus on the, the poor and the disenfranchised. So obviously, I have an interest in, in the success of all students and African-American students. But uh, when I look at the third number, the incentive grant, I'm frightened a bit because the, the unintensive consequences may put them further back. So I don't want that to happen. I want us to, to, just, to everything to be transparent and to think through all the processes and to make sure that our intention shuns, intentions are realized. Thank you. Okay. And maybe yeah, just please. to be clear, I, I, I don't think I'm going too far to say that I think in that third bucket, um, our intent is that uh, we can't have outcomes without a consideration of the types of students um, mm -hmm. that we need to link the outcomes also to the populations that um, have historically been underserved. Right. Well, thank you for your presentation and being on the hot seat and, you know, his colleagues, nobody rushed up there to sit <laughs> on either side of you. <laughs> but, but they're a very collegial group, don't worry. Um, a couple things. One, I want to say that the governor, as usual, he's sort of put forth a bold idea and challenged us to to make it better. Um, 
And so the Department of Finance proposal has stimulated this conversation, has accelerated a conversation we've been having in bits and spurts, you know, fits and starts for a number of years. Um, I also have been on this board for four years and have been so frustrated by the very small incremental improvements we've seen. The legislature and the governor have given the community colleges during my tenure on this board quite a bit of extra money. As we've been flush in the state, we've received um, a great deal of money, a great deal of confidence from the governor and the legislature because our students are the neediest, our students are the largest proportion of students in higher ed in our state and I think represent really the bulk of what is gonna be the future of our workforce. So it's, it's been a tremendous investment that's been made in our system. Um, what we have now with guided pathways and this sense of um, trying to align around a very clear vision with clear metrics is we need to actually then create the incentive structure around our funding. Um, I am a strong believer in that, in clear performance metrics you always have to then build in that fail safe. You're right, Christian. You always have to build in that fail safe. So the, the Department of Finance's proposal is interesting. Um, certainly the way they've phased it in has provided a little bit of a safe harbor, but then having enough time, even though it feels like a breakneck pace, for the chancellor to confer with the CEOs and the CBOs and others and the faculty is really important. And I really appreciate the speakers here today coming forward with their thoughts I thank you for FAC, for giving us all the information. Really appreciate that. It's always helpful to have a specific proposal to consider. And on the second piece of the funding formula where the supplemental grant is proposed to really just be based on uh, college promise grant fee waivers and Pell Grant recipients, I thought it was interesting the way you guys have proposed some sort of a blended approach. And so something I hope the Department of Finance will consider. I'm not sure if it's the right way to go, but it gives a more nuance than just a pure income um, consideration. Um, but a couple of points. I uh, feel this sense of urgency, I say it almost every time I come to this board, that we can't waste another generation, right? We just can't. We have to have better outcomes, and we can't do this tiny incremental improvement every year, even though we're plowing literally billions of additional dollars in there, because this moment won't last, right? We are going to have a time when there's an economic downturn. There's already some signs of that, and certainly in the real estate market, which is the thing I know pretty well. So this setting us up for a new funding formula that will account for changes in the, and the, and the changes in demography and the reduction in enrollment, um, and that will also help us get through a time when we have more people coming into the system is really important. So we need to plan for the long term. I think this is an important first step in that direction. Um, I want to say that there are programs at work, and our new board member, Rawlings, asked the question, so you know, so what should colleges be doing if they want to hit that performance? What, what are some good examples? In our last board meeting, we heard a really inspiring presentation from Cuyamaca College about how they've completely redone um, their remedial education and gone directly into um, college-ready courses. Uh, it was tremendous presentation on how they did that both in the English side and on the math side and have had great success, but it took a lot of commitment from the faculty and from the leadership of that campus. Um, and they also got an innovation grant to help them do that, if that was my recollection. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an example. We've read about UC Riverside that has eliminated the performance gap for African Americans, just eliminated it. Do we know about this? We do know about this, so it can be done. And there are plenty of examples, plenty of model programs, pilot programs, little programs here and there, bigger programs. We need to now take it to scale. And this is one way to quickly focus the mind of administrators to take it, and faculty, to take it to scale. This is not about tinkering around the edges to compete for a special pot of money, an innovation grant here or there. No, this is about your funding. This is about where you live. And I think that the governor's proposal and the Department of Finance proposal has focused the mind. It's up to us now in this intervening period to help frame it a little bit differently. We have more sense of the nuance. We have the access to um, the faculty and the CEOs and the CBOs to give us some shading on how we might better um, propose this formula. But I think it's on the right track. And particularly with half of, with half of it on the basic funding, 25% tiered towards or aimed at encouraging colleges to get enrollment for the folks who need our access to our schools the most. So then we're really only fighting over the last 25%. Mm -hmm. 
And I have a lot of faith in the faculty. They're not going to dumb down their programs. They're not going to they're not going to compromise their standards. They're not going to suddenly change their curve so that they're just passing massive students out of their classes who are not, are not qualified to pass their classes. That's not been my experience with our faculty. Our faculty has a great deal of integrity. Heck, they spent two years working something out with the apprenticeship program. So we know that they care deeply about making sure that their standards are met. They take their mission seriously. So I don't worry about that. I don't worry about some CEO telling faculty, hey, you better start passing people and making sure we get completions because that's what you're going to be measured against. Rather, I think the faculty will be really smart and say, here are the resources we need to deliver the outcomes you expect of us. And that's what we need from you. You've given us a proposal, and it's helpful. Um, it's helpful to see your ideas of what it, what it would take, what it would take to give you the capacity to give us the outcomes we need. I particularly note on your final element, um, talking about the academic counselor to student ratios, really important. We haven't talked about it enough. We, our student um, counselor ratios are appalling in our system. I'd really love to see an, a future investment in that. But whatever the proposal is to get to that third 25% increment, I think we need to give our schools flexibility. We need to give them a lot of support. The chancellor's office has to step up in a big way to make available to our colleges a whole suite of proposals that they could use off the shelf, proven measures of success, proven ways to get better outcomes that they can tailor for their individual schools. That's the only way it's going to work with a system as large as ours, as a state as diverse as ours. So with that, um, I look forward to hearing what happens next. Um, if there are other public meetings or other discussions, I think, Christian, if you can let board members know because this is going to be a pretty intensive period between now and the May revise. If there's an open meeting um, in any of, the, of our cities, just let us all know, because we may want to show up. I think this is, this is really the heart of what we do at the Board of Governors. Um, so we will hear back from you in May, right? Absolutely. And right now, we're going to take a break. This item is over. We're going to eat lunch. We're going to go into closed session and hear about exciting legal matters, and we'll be back. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>